And so I think that science can offer a better world, and in fact, a world that's more ethical, and to the extent that you talk about morality, then, then, then you can get from, from um, uh, books written iron, based on iron, iron Age peasants who, who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. I really think that, in fact, if you look at, at democracies and science, science has not flourished in countries that don't have democracies, and democracy can't function without the very things that science is based on, an informed public, an informed legislature, basically, who base public policy on empirical facts instead of ideology. And that's very important in my Lawrence, mind. so just briefly take the other side of the equation, and that is the impact that religious ethics have upon science. It has none. <laughs> I, 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 none whatsoever. In fact, the, the, you know, religion never enters into science. Uh, but there are, well, for example, the Catholic Church has strong positions on reproductive technology, for example, so it does enter into the science market in that regard. Well, whenever they do, they get it wrong. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when the Pope says that, say, condoms contribute to AIDS in Africa, that's not science, that's ideology, and it's nonsense, because, of course, we know that empirical evidence tells us that, in fact, women who, whose husbands have AIDS, should be, they should be using condoms. It's not, it's not an ideological question, it's a scientific one, and we want to save lives. And so I think that whenever you see the church or religion trying to intrude upon science, they almost always get it wrong. Let's go to uh, John Dixon. Should uh, the church, the values of faith and God, uh, as a questioner asked, should they be involved in science in any way? I agree with almost everything Lawrence just said, actually. Uh, except I, I would beg to differ about whether science can actually produce an ethic. I think uh, human beings produce an ethic and we decide whether to use science uh, positively or negatively according to our world view. And history is littered with examples of science being used brilliantly, uh, ethically so, uh, and times when it's used badly. I disagree that science has any ethical import. It's a, it's a neutral discipline, and it's a wonderful discipline. The little quips that I heard throughout uh, about uh, science is all about humility and so on, I love. Uh, in fact, Peter Harrison of Oxford University, who's one of the world's leading historians of science, thinks that it was a revolution in this doctrine of humility that uh, flourished in the 14th and 15th centuries that got science going in Europe, in part. It's not a total uh, explanation, but that as Augustine philosophy developed, which basically said human beings are flawed, so we need better techniques. We can't trust our brains. We need to observe. And this Augustinian philosophy grew out of Christianity, as you know, and so Christianity probably is in part responsible for science in the first place. I agree that it shouldn't stick its head in now and tell the scientists what to do. My view is, let the scientists do the science well, and, I, uh, and, and let uh, religious believers do what they do. Well, I agree with you. I think historically, if you look at it, because the church was the only game in town in the 15th century, they, science arose out of, out of religion and it's great and, and it served a good purpose and now we should just put it in. I expected my kids to be taught science in science classes at their local state school. So I was a bit angry when my son was taught a creation story about the origin of the universe in his year 11 physics class at a local high school. My son didn't want me to do anything because he was concerned about possible repercussions for his grades which in Queensland count toward university entrance. So I want to know from the panel what your attitude is towards the teaching of religion in science classes and to Tanya and Greg in particular, what you and your parties will do to stop religion being taught in our science classes. Tanya Plibersek, let's start with you. Well, I just think that's an extraordinary story. I, I'm quite happy for kids at school to, to participate in religious education if their parents want them to, but science is science and I don't think um, there are many scientists who uh, would accept the literal interpretation of the Bible, um, the creation of the earth. 
uh, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. We've got a national curriculum so, being developed. Uh, I, was I say, don't yeah, think yeah, creationism yeah. is going to be in the science curriculum of the national curriculum. So will, will the federal government indeed. be in a position to impose a national curriculum on states like Queensland if they choose to continue not to do that? Well, uh, look, I'm not sure how widespread this is. Well, that's a state and school. Y yes, but it's one state school. Mm -hmm. You might have run into one teacher with particularly. Um, particular views in one school. Um, I don't know that we can say that that is a characterisation of what's being taught in science in all of our state schools. I'd be very surprised. My question is for Lawrence Krauss. You may know that some evangelical religious groups have direct access to children in Australian public schools. My research has shown that some of these organisations teach that man and dinosaurs once lived together that the earth is only 6,000 years old and the children will burn in hell if they don't read the Bible every day. How might teaching such things to children in state education affect Australia's future? All right, Lawrence Gross, that was directed to you. So we'll go to you first and then we'll hear from the rest of the panel. Okay, well, um, I've uh, recently in the United States uh, just uh, uh, stated that uh, cr teaching creationism is child abuse, and I, I think it is. Uh, Namely, if you withhold knowledge or you do anything to children that puts them at a competitive disadvantage uh, as adults, it's child abuse. It's mild forms of child abuse, but it's, 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 it's like withholding med medicine, withholding knowledge uh, that later on will cause kids to become less competitive because evolution is the basis of modern biology. And, and teaching things that are basically lies, even if they're well-intentioned, is child abuse. I mean, people, it's not that people are doing this to be evil, but they're, they're hurting their children, especially, of course, telling kids they're going to go to hell. That's definitely child abuse. It is inappropriate, and teachers not only should not be doing this, but in fact, if they are, they should be removed, in my opinion, because the purpose of education, as I've often said, is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. Yeah. This is going to be an agree fest, I think. Great. Uh, I agree. Uh, but for one thing that, that I think uh, lowers, <laughs> lowers the tone. Uh, uh, on the science, I totally agree. And you'll find that most uh, mainstream Christians are very comfortable with science. Yeah. And with all of the discoveries of science, including the 13.72 uh, billion years ago, there was a bang. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, evolution by natural selection, Th this is standard. Uh, when you go to theological college, you are taught how to read Genesis 1. And it's quite clear that Genesis 1 is written in a style that is most unlike the historical prose we know from <coughs> other parts of the Bible. The style is not quite poetry, but it's more in the direction of poetry. It uses number symbolism in a way that would blow your mind. The artistry of it is clear. Now, uh, this is not Christians in the modern world scared of evolution or the findings of science and so changing what they think of the Bible. This was the view of ancient Jews like Philo of Alexandria in the first century, uh, the, the greatest theologian of the ancient world, uh, Saint Augustine, uh, Origen, Clement, and so on. This was a pre-scientific analysis of the text. So I think uh, whatever science discovers and can truly uh, demonstrate, I saw... Dr. or Professor Krauss, it seems to me that everything science examines shows us more beauty and complexity to the universe we live in. When you think about it philosophically, this amazing complexity points towards an intelligent first cause. Well, I mean, that's how it works with humans, you know. Um, only intelligent minds can create complex things. Isn't it bad parenting to force your children to learn that people evolved uh, from the ancestors of monkeys without letting them have the opportunity to think about it logically and come to their own conclusion. Well, look, I don't think you should force kids to do anything, but what you should try and do is explain to them how the world works and give them evidence and, in fact, ask them to try and understand the world through evidence, okay? Now, the point is, the evidence tells us, it's not a matter of opinion, the evidence tells us that evolution happened. Okay? And in fact, it's the basis of modern biology. It's the basis of modern drug development. And, to, to, and I agree with you that science tells us, I mean, it just makes the world fascinating and far more interesting than, than, than myth 
And in fact, I get upset when people say that science isn't spiritual. I get spiritual wonder looking at every Hubble Space Telescope picture. But, and, and, and science, in fact, is better kind of spirituality because it's real. And I think that's the important thing. So you're absolutely right. I don't think so parents should force kids to do anything. But what they should try and do is encourage kids to learn and provide them the best available knowledge base. And, and, and it is unfortunate that some people, for some reason, as, as you seem to do, fear the notion of the fact of the reality that humans and, and, and uh, hum that uh, all species descended from a common ancestor. It's just unequivocal. The, the, it's the best tested theory in science. And it's not, we don't hold to it because we have some, some you know, secret handshake. If we're wrong, it'd be great because the way to make become famous in science is to prove your colleagues wrong. <laughs> and so, I'm, I'm going to go back, yeah, uh, anyway. you mentioned the Hubble telescope, our questioner is Tim Hubble. Uh, <laughs> no, no relation, I suspect, but in any, in any event, I mean, do you, listening to what you're saying, do you, do you believe that evolution and religious um, theories about the origins of human beings should be taught alongside each other in science? Um, I, I think, yeah, they can be taught alongside each other, I guess. The, the question is really the first cause. Um, it, and uh, that's a philosophical question. Science but can't explain uh, the first cause. That's got nothing to do with biology. First so. cause is a complex philosophical question, and, and I, I deal with it in some sense as a scientist, as a cosmologist who worries about how the universe began. But that's very different than the facts of biology. And so the question that's of concern to you is very different than teaching kids how biology works. And it's a disservice to them not to teach them. It essentially discredits science by saying that scientists are self-interested. The reason that people are researching climate change is that there's something in it for them. And the, the practical impact of that really worries me because it allows people to ignore the vast body of scientific evidence in an area like climate change and cling to, well, you know, it's, I don't feel hotter today than I did yesterday, so it's obviously made up. And the, the example in Queensland that really worried me recently was um, the Queensland government giving permission to local councils to stop putting fluoride in water. Now, the biggest health uh, intervention in dental care in Australia for decades is putting fluoride in water. Any dentist you talk to will tell you they can tell who grew up in Queensland where they've had less fluoride in the water, they've got a mouthful of fillings compared with people who've grow, well, grown up with fluoride. Um, yeah. And, and it, it drives me nuts that we've got Queen, people in the Queensland Parliament saying one guy who's a bodybuilder in the Queensland Parliament said he would rather take banned substances for a year than drink a glass of water with fluoride in it. <coughs> it's so, nuts. Is he, 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 he well, especially well muscled? He, so. he is actually rather well muscled. <laughs> oh, he's his to... teeth, however. <laughs> he's also... <laughs> he's well muscled in his head, I think. Sidney Pan. I just want to say, um, in, with your comment, the irony is that people who spend all this money buying bottled water because they're scared yeah. of tap water, they're the ones who've got their dental problems because that doesn't yeah. have the fluoride. Yep. Um, you know, this idea that tap water has problems, it's actually the best... It's yep. the best thing best to drink. drink. Yeah. Best drink to give your kids. <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty much free. The uh, next question comes from Aaron Kingsley. Uh, my question is to Professor Krauss. Wow. The last time that your good friend Richard Dawkins was on Q&A, he was asked rather mockingly how we can possibly get something from nothing. Being a biologist and not a physicist, Richard respectfully declined to give a comprehensive answer. He mentioned that people often found it hard to deal with the fact that there was nothing before the Big Bang. Yet when you ask the same people what came before God, they often say nothing or that he had always existed. Now that we have you here, could you please give us a more detailed explanation as to how the universe can in fact arise from nothing? <laughs> okay, in a minute. Um, uh, what is amazing, it is an amazing fact, and, and I watched Richard when he was here actually trying to explain evolution to Cardinal Pell who couldn't understand it. But uh, um, the, the, the amazing thing is that one of the things we've learned from science is that our common sense does not necessarily apply to the universe. Uh, we, we evolved to avoid tigers on the plains of Africa, but not to understand quantum mechanics. And so the way the re universe really works is very often, as I say, defines common sense. And what is truly remarkable, and the reason I've been talking about it and writing about it lately, is that we understand that in fact, empty space, which for many people is a good first example of nothing, is actually unstable. Quantum mechanics will allow particles to suddenly pop out of nothing, and it doesn't violate any laws of physics. 
just the known laws of quantum mechanics and relativity can produce 400 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars. And then beyond that, it turns out when you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, space itself can arise from nothing, as can time. It seems impossible, but it's completely possible. And what is amazing to me is if you asked what would be the characteristics of a universe that came from nothing by laws of physics, it would be precisely the characteristics of the universe we measure. And in fact, one of your Australians measured a key part of it and won a Nobel Prize. He's been on this program. My friend Brian Schmidt. And it, that was completely unexpected. It is amazing that our universe looks exactly like a universe that could have come from nothing. Does that prove it? No. But it makes it plausible. And that is amazing. Just like, in fact, before Darwin, evolution was a miracle. Or life was a miracle. Every, every, every life form was specially created. Darwin didn't know about DNA and genetics, but he showed that looking at the evidence, it was plausible that, that all of the diversity of life could come from a simple beginning. And I find those things worth celebrating, independent of whether they relate to God or not. The universe is unbelievably amazing. Uh, if you're claiming that the universe came from nothing, and nothing isn't really nothing, where did the nothing come from? No, well, look. <laughs> Look, you know, the, the interesting thing is I science... Add, where did the laws of physics come from? I didn't say it's not from. nothing. I actually think the point is science changes what we mean by words. So I've, you know, I've discussed with philosophers and they say, you know what, we don't like your definition of nothing because it's not what Aristotle described. Well, the point is so science changes the meaning of things. It's called learning. And, and, the, and, 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 and you might have said that nothing was an infinite empty void like the Bible would have said. Well, that would be empty space. Okay? We've learned that that kind of nothing is much more complicated than you thought. There's nothing in it. There's no real particles, but it actually has properties. But then I, the point is that we, you can go much further and say there's no space, no time, no universe, and not even any fundamental laws. Yeah. And it could all spontaneously arise. And it seems to me, if you have no laws, no space, no time, no particles, no radiation, it's a pretty good approximation to nothing. But uh, uh, Harold actually asked the question, uh, I think you were saying, did the laws of physics equally spring from nothing, fully formed well, into, it, into existence what from is nothing? It, what, it, what is surprising is that, it, that the conventional wisdom at right now, which could be wrong, and that's the other nice thing about science, we, we don't mind being wrong and changing our minds, unlike religion, but uh, <laughs> um, is, that, is that in fact, the, because of discovering that empty space has energy, it seems quite plausible that our universe may be one part, one, just one universe in what could be a, almost an infinite number of universes, and in every universe the laws of physics are different, and they come into existence when the universe comes into existence. So our laws of physics, physics may become, God forbid, forgive me for saying could, that, could, could but some, God, could, just environmental science. Could our, some of those universes have gods creating them? Uh, <laughs> no, because, <laughs> the, the, no, the, because it, it, it's, it, the point is that you know, when people say that you need, a, you need a God to create a universe, you need an intelligence to create a universe, th they, uh, then the key question, of course, is, well, if God is more complex than the universe, then how could God come into existence? Mm. And okay. so I'm, I'm going to let you do that. I, I, I threw that to you. First of all, Harold is, uh, well, well, Harold is well, I mean, trying to be brave God. enough to re-enter this debate. Yeah, I mean, forget the whole thing about God. What I'm, what I'm hearing for you is that, hey, these people like Aristotle, uh, are addressing nothing and it's no properties, an empty set. But now, in order for us to an answer it, let's change the meaning of the term. So in order to get an answer, let's just change the question no, altogether. No, 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 no. Well, well, it's true that in science we try and answer questions that are answerable, which is really an important thing, I think. But the, I would argue that nothing is a physical quantity. It's the absence of something. Okay? So to understand what nothing is, you have to think carefully about what something is. And that's what science tells us. So we're trying to, uh, we're trying to take an, an empirical approach to try and understand what the absence of something is. And I think you're, there are deep philosophical issues that we're not going to resolve in this program, but I do think... But they are the problem with what you're saying. Okay. This, well, this well, where well, I want yeah, to yeah, No, 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 I think we've got to let John jump <laughs> in here. Physicists. Or he'll explode. <laughs> <laughs> the big bang. There'll be a big bang, that's right. <laughs> Physicists have every right to go and uh, discover things and uh, to, An propose, obligation, in fact. to propose theories. And uh, Lawrence has a theory that's uh, been out a while that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you will, that basically there's a vacuum, <laughs> no you've got virtual and antiparticles that pop in and out of existence. 
Uh, they have energy values, but the average ener energy is zero. They're operating according to the quantum uh, laws. That's nothing. And I just want to say, th this is part of the problem with new atheism. It's the... It's science, not atheism. It's, it's the overreach. Here is a physicist telling us about something that all of us think sounds like something and saying by some magical change of the English language, no, it's nothing. And if you disagree with me, then you don't understand science. But there no, are scientists, leading scientists, who agree this ain't nothing. It's a very complex and beautiful something. And I think Tim's point earlier is the key point. Uh, we live in a universe that operates according to these elegant, beautiful laws. And when I read your book this week, I was more convinced that that's the case. And this universe uh, operating according to these elegant laws has produced minds that now understand the laws, especially this mind well, next to us. Yeah. And uh, so this to me all looks, and this is not a proof for God, mm. but I'm just saying why a lot of people think the God thing's got a lot going for it, the whole thing looks rational. The whole thing looks set up to be known. Now only known in a rational, uh, like the God of Einstein. So then you've got to ask yourself the question, is there any evidence on the world stage that this God we think is maybe just a mind has touched the earth in a tangible way? And for me, if you're asking me why do I think there's a God, it's this uh, philosophy of science plus the life of Jesus. Well, yeah, but which, hold on. You, there was a bait and switch there that I, that I object to, and that was that... Can I get that, to the end of the bait? Well, you said Jesus, and then you started going off. And, and so, no longer, okay. so what I'm saying is, you ask yourself the question, is there any tangible thing in the history of the world that looks like contact from the God we suspect might be there? The, the overwhelming, I think, overwhelming evidence points in the direction of Jesus, his life, his teaching and his healings, his death and resurrection. And when I come to believe that, uh, this opens up the world to me. It's like C.S. Lewis saying, uh, I believe in Christianity for the same reason I believe in the sun, not because I can look at it, but because by it I see everything. And for me, Christianity explains the world I live in in such a spooky and deep way that I find I, I feel I've met the God I had a hunch was there based mm -hmm. only on the beautiful well, it, okay. elegance. Uh, all right, so, yeah. so now we've moved into the... Now we, I was going to say, I, I'd like Lawrence to respond to that. We've moved into the area of intuition now. Um, and perhaps and perhaps we have also with your idea of nothing. And this is the problem, isn't it? We have two competing theories no, as no, to how to... the world came into existence. Well, I think the point is, it's, I really object when it's two competing theories. One, a scientific theory is falsifiable, it's testable. God isn't testable. I can't disprove the existence of God. I can't disprove the possibility that we all were created three seconds ago with the, with the memories of, of this delightful conversation we've had. So the, the point is well, that we, we can putting play science... We can tape later. <laughs> putting, put, putting, putting science and religion as if they're competing theories does a disservice to science because science... You know, you can That's say... That's what you're hearing no, from me, though, is Well, it? no, it is because you're saying that exp explains the world to you. It doesn't... Exp Christianity doesn't explain how airplanes fly yeah. or how... And, and, and the, the bait and switch that, that worried me is when you say all of this provides clear evidence that there's intelligence or design. The point is, the universe behaves... But the universe, if you look at it, it behaves as if there's no purpose to the universe. Now, does that prove there's no purpose? Absolutely not. But a universe that behaves without purpose, and a universe created by God to look like a universe without purpose, well, they might as well be the same to me. It makes God irrelevant, and God is irrelevant. When I, okay, okay. I'm, no, I don't want to make the rest of our panel irrelevant. I want to hear <laughs> yeah, okay. how they're responding to your arguments, and I'll start with Tanya Plibersek. Well, the, the only thing that I'd like to hear a bit more of is um, the science of Star Trek. Yeah, like so Star if Trek. we could move the conversation a little bit more to the science of Star Trek, that would be excellent. Um, I'm happy about that. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really enjoying the discussion, Tony. I, I think um, the 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 opposition of um, atheism, and uh, atheism and science on one side and, um, and re religion on the other side, I don't think is a fair opposition though. And I, I think um, when, you, when you keep 
talking to Lawrence about the new atheism, he, that's not the point he's making at all. He's not trying to disprove the um, existence of God. He's just saying that there's a, a whole lot of science that explains a lot to us and that we're learning more about it all the time. And um, there's a whole lot of things that we can't explain with science yet, but we may well one day. And there's a great example of that at the moment uh, in the last few years. Um, there's a whole lot of um, genetic material, um, junk DNA um, that uh, people thought was irrelevant to the way that the human body worked. And all of the time we're now finding in that junk DNA, the little bits in between um, the, the bits that doctors and scientists have always been interested in, finding that the junk DNA um, affects the way that the body behaves or responds to drugs or better treatments can be developed. And I think that that's a really good analogy for our understanding of the world as well. I, I hope and expect that my children and grandchildren will understand the universe a whole lot better. And one thing, though, Lawrence, I did um, um, want to um, disagree with you on, you, you talked about we've evolved to kind of escape from tigers, but I think that it is a marvellous thing about the human mind that we have this quest for understanding of how the universe started and, and how our bodies work and you know all of the things that are unclear to us now it's a um, it is a beautiful and unique thing about the human mind. Uh, obviously from a science and particularly from a medical perspective the truth of evolution and uh, you know Darwinism, Mendelian theory, I mean this is alive and well today and, and I was thinking when you were talking about physicists and evolution I mean with physicists and scientists as, and doctors it is survival of the fittest because basically if your theory can be destroyed by a fitter or more logical theory then it will be so it is the survival of the most logical or more, more scientific and rigorously thought through theories that um, prevail and allow then further theories to be built on those theories. I, I, could, I just want to jump in one more time because yeah. I want, I, I, you know, it sounded very good what you said, Greg, but, however. but well, however, it, I mean, it does sound good, but I, I think your determination of, of the good life you want to live to a great extent is based on science. In fact, it, you know, it, it's based on the fact that you, you shouldn't have slaves, that women actually are equals of men, that, that, uh, uh, all the things that science has ultimately led us to have produced what I think most of what you would describe as a good life. I ask people, if you stop believing God, would you go out and murder your neighbor? I've actually had some people say yes, but, <laughs> but, but I think it's not God, it's not, it's not that faith, it's rationality. And science has brought a rational view that has led to a to much of what I think you, you would describe as the good life that you that you promote. You're a popular man tonight, Professor Krauss. This is again for you. Um, discussions about climate change have become increasingly polarized and um, emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. On one extreme, uh, you've got people who deny that climate change is real, and on the other extreme, um, people deny that they're. They say that the science is done and that there is no debate and no uncertainty. Mm. Um, so as a physicist, would you agree that due to the extremely complex nature of climate systems, climate science uh, doesn't have the capacity for rigorous proof and... Uh, sorry, what was my question? <laughs> uh, uh, and predictive powers, as physics does. And if so, do you think this should influence the tone of the discussions well, around climate change? Well, climate science is complex. I do physics because it's easy. Um, <laughs> but but I, I disagree with you. I think, you know, the point is that, that um, climate scientists are scientists. They're trying to make predictions and test their models. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that in fact our models are basically correct. But the thing that is often not realized about climate change is not a prediction of the future. It's happening. Mm. It's data. Mm. Sea levels are rising. But the, is, there is a lot of predictions that are made by climate scientists, and I'm not coming at, and, at this and, question and, and, from but, a but, denial. But I, think, but I think the key point that you mentioned is the word uncertainty. The great thing about science is that there's uncertainty. Because in science, and probably it's the only area of a human activity, where you can actually quantify your uncertainty. And the good climate scientists will build models and they'll, they'll quantify their uncertainty. And, uh, and, and, and that, is, that, that makes it more powerful and not less powerful. But, but do you think that people acknowledge that, though? Because I find that a lot in the public debate, there's people who just say there is no uncertainty. The, the, what science well, there's no uncertainty is, about is the data. I mean, facts, you know, it's true that models are, depend upon, you know, some of them are right or some of them are wrong. But the facts are that the climate is changing. And the climate is changing at an incredibly accelerated rate that is completely consistent with human industrial activity. And, and it's 
terrifying. I just ran a climate change meeting at my institute. It is terrifying how the real facts of climate change, especially in my country, are not discussed at all. I'm very proud of Australia because of its carbon tax, to tell you the truth. Although I'm not so proud of the fact that you don't tax the carbon that you sell to China so they can burn. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, you know, all right.